Long ago, when the world was coming to life, a great serpent came down from the north. As she passed, she carved a wild river through the earth and laid her eggs, millions of radiant eggs, deep in the bedrock. The rains came. The river took on a life of its own. The land grew abundant. As long as the serpent's eggs lay undisturbed, they would do no harm. White people came here a long time ago, took all the furs, eh? Trapped all the beaver out and the otter and the mink, things like that, and they gathered them all these things up. And they, they went away and they left us in the bush and the rocks. It wasn't too long later they came back again. They call that logging. Cut down all the trees, white pine, red pine, Cut it all down, and they left us on the bare rocks. Then they discovered uranium here, and the old man said, now the sons of bitches are back for the rocks. Here's where the story begins. Inside hot, dark, rocky caverns, where the magic word is uranium. Native-born Canadians and newcomers from a dozen European countries work side by side, round the clock, in a tower of fable atmosphere whose offspring is Canada's fastest growing and most modern small city. Elliot Lake's growth is explosive in more ways than one. In its natural state, uranium gives off atomic radiation for billions of years. Normally, the Earth shields us from most of these harmful rays. But when the rock is brought to the surface and crushed, that protective shield is lost. Undetectable by any human sense, atomic radiation penetrates living cells and disrupts their internal functions, often damaging them beyond repair. Elliott Lake, Ontario, is one of Canada's nuclear capitals. Since the mid-1950s, these mines have supplied uranium, first for atomic bombs and later to generate electricity. For every barrel of usable product that leaves the mill, tons of solid and liquid waste are dumped on site. The sand-like tailings contain far more radioactivity than the extracted uranium. They contain a dozen radioactive byproducts, as well as heavy metals, acids, and other chemicals dangerous to animal and human life. If mining continues at 1988 production levels, the industry will have dumped 300 million tons by the end of the century. Fallout from radioactive gas given off by the tailings will accumulate in vegetation for thousands of years to come. They are Canada's slow bombs. Unless they can be perfectly contained, contaminants from the Elliott Lake mines will continue to migrate down the Serpent River and into the Great Lakes. 
80 kilometers downstream from the mines lies the Serpent River Indian Reserve. It is home to several hundred Ojibwe people. There is a lot of sickness here, and they've begun to wonder why. We get to accept death if we want economic prosperity. Uh, we get to accept death if we want what's labeled a good standard of living. It's not a good standard of living if you get sick. And it's, that's not a Rosalie Bertel, of of a research scientist. So the, the standard's wrong. Her work is focused on the health effects of low-level radiation. Running after the wrong things. We don't have to commit suicide. We don't have to kill the earth. But that's the road we're on. So it's going to take some turning so that the next generation has an option because they're not going to have a choice if we don't make a change. Thank you. For several years, this factory on the Serpent River Indian Reserve produced sulfuric acid for the mills at Elliott Lake. When the plant was shut down, the band pressured company and government officials to remove it. After six years, the Department of Indian Affairs got the Canadian Army to take care of the problem. The Army's demolition exercise left behind a hundred acres of rubble laced with toxic chemicals. For two decades, the band protested. A survey by the International Institute of Concern for Public Health cited serious health problems on the reserve. Finally, in 1988, federal funds came through for the removal of the contaminated earth to a dump site in a neighboring township. The community still has the problem of radioactive contamination to deal with. Little is known about its total impact on populations living in the vicinity of the mines. Well, it's the same thing. These are very small particles that you can't see or feel, and they come in there like uh, minute bullets, and they do damage to the body, but you can't see them. So until you begin to realize you're being polluted, uh, you don't object. And so part of what we're trying to do is wake people up before it's too late. And what really bothers me is the uh, damage, the brain damage to children and the uh, health damage to children. They're going to be less able to solve these problems than we are. So if we say it's too tough for us to do, uh, what is a, a handicapped generation going to do? You know, uh, we've got more going for us than they will. So when they do that uranium mining, they dewater that mine, and they send that water out. Winona LaDuke is a native rights activist. Discharge it. Mm -hmm. She has already seen the impact of uranium mining on Aboriginal people in the American Southwest. This is her first visit to Serpent River. Gertrude Lewis is the local postmistress. And um, this is one of the uranium miners who worked down on Navajo Reservation. This is a Navajo man who has lung cancer. Also people who lived in that community who weren't just miners were affected by that. A lot of people were starting to get uh, uh, cancers. Mm -hmm. And then uh, they had a really high, this here's a picture of a baby. Here, this is a Navajo Indian baby who has uh, birth defects. Mm -hmm. They had a lot of children down there who had um, mongoloidism mm -hmm. and uh, like a cleft palate, mm -hmm. club foot. A couple of years ago they did a study down there and they ha found a really high rate of birth defects in that community. What they can di did is they linked that there is a direct, you know, uh, that radiation causes these kinds of effects mm -hmm. and that these people have these kinds of <clears throat> impacts. You know, and then mm -hmm. those, a lot of those doctors at the Indian Health Service said that it was from the uranium mining and from the radiation. Uh, 
we were surprised at that because it didn't make much sense. Homer Sagan, regional representative for the United Steelworkers Union. High levels of radium-226 from the polluted lake. About 1978, we found that there were high radium contents in the river, and we pressured the government through various tactics into building a radium removal plant, which you see here. Now, the unfortunate part about that is that they wouldn't provide the water for the Indians on the other side of the river who take water from here, too. They only provided it for the white settlement. That didn't make an awful lot of sense, so when we argued and investigated that, they said, well, the Indians are federal matter, and white people are provincial matter, so that the white community end up, gets treated water, the Indian community doesn't. It's supposed to be uh, not safe on this side, but it's safe on the other side. So the Indians still don't have good water? To the best of my knowledge, the Indians still either take the water from the river or take it from other sources like wells, which tend to be contaminated too, and they've been told in writing not to drink the, the water from here nor to eat the fish from here. Well, where are they supposed to get their water? <laughs> That's a good question, I think. They're still searching for that answer themselves. There he is, Kate. There he is. Right over the corner of the sand. Big right. Okay, I see. Until a few years ago, Gilbert Oskabus and his nephew, Kenny Miyawasaji, would hunt and fish along the Serpent River. Now their world has been turned against them. They say that stuff gets into the moose, eh? That radio, radio nuclides or something they call it. Gets into the food chain, you know? It gets into the river and uh, gets into the plants, and the, the plants absorb it, and the moose eats that, and then we end up eating the moose, eh? So whatever the hell comes down from the mines there eventually ends up in us, eh? Bad stuff. Where's this water go to? Do white people get this water? Oh, yeah, yeah. Yeah. Goes right down to their communities, you know, the Serpent River Town, the Sprague Town, eh? And it goes out into the Great Lakes. And they get it down all along the, the Great Lakes and the St. Lawrence River. St. Lawrence River is the sewer of North America right now. So it doesn't stay here, eh? The, little dark cloud of pollution doesn't hover over us. The water doesn't stay around our village. It goes all over the place, eh? They get that, too. I wish they'd understand that. It's kind of like making a mess in your house, eh? You know, you, you don't go and shit in the corner of your house or pee in your bedrooms or something. That'll catch up to you sooner or later, eh? You can't do that, eh? But that's what they're doing here, you know? They just don't understand. Come on, you muckin' slushers, you jack leg drillers and blasters. The price of uranium is up and there's money to make. Come on, you big rock boulders, who answer to the name of miners. This old boom town is still around on the shores of Elliot Lake. I'm cards in and out, up and down cages Gonna make a heaven out of hell earn wages Come on, quirky, pay me now I got 18 holes to go and pow, pow, pow And there ain't no music minor She's a damn good song for a minor A damn good song for a minor When the mines opened at Elliott Lake Few jobs were made available to Native people in 1970, Martin Nasinui got one and considered himself lucky. Fifteen years later, illness had forced him to quit. Now he's back where he started, working with his wife in the maple sugar bush. That is where I worked and that is where I got this cancer. I inhaled this poison air. That's what the doctor has told me. That is where you got your sickness from, the doctor said. And that is true. Where I work, there were many other Indian people and also many white people. I guess most of us will be dying in a short time. I'm afraid all of us will eventually die from this. In Sigling, on the Sayonee. 
There is no other industry that uh, has seen the, uh, the amount of uh, industrial diseases we're facing. There's very little we can do. The, the time bomb uh, is ticking. It's going to explode. Uh, it, it's just going to continue well after these mines are closed. There's indisputable evidence to prove that uranium miners experience a very high incidence of lung cancer. A 1982 publication of Canada's Atomic Energy Control Board estimated the risk to miners working for 50 years at current acceptable levels of radiation exposure. It concluded they will experience two to four times as many lung cancers as the average population. Very few other industries have had the hazard recognized for as long and have done so little about it. For the British Columbia Medical Association, uh, now, Dr. Robert Woolard uh, co-authored a report on the hazards of uranium mining and the government's failure to adequately regulate the industry. The current regulations would allow a doubling of the incidence of lung cancer among miners that were exposed. In the area of uranium mining, I would say that the Atomic Energy Control Board's uh, record is uh, abysmal. I'm a farmer on Manitoulin Island, and uh, as the crow flies, I'm not very far from Elliot Lake uh, or the mouth of the Serpent River. When I look at it from the point of being a, a sort of a steward uh, of the land, having my land in trust. And when I look at this enormous problem of uh, the radioactive elements that are probably blowing towards my farm right now, and, uh, and the water, the radium that goes in the Serpent River from the tailing piles, it bothers me quite a bit. We know that the milfoil and the sedges and water lilies and white mosses and uh, many other uh, plants take this material up. And, and the fish, the uptake in the, in the fish, in the bone and in the flesh. And so when it reaches the, when it moves up the food chain, then it reaches the point where it's not acceptable. It's not acceptable to anybody. So you can regulate it to a point, but you can't stop it from moving up the food chain. A lot of the people that work in the regulatory agencies are, are past employees of, of the utility company or uh, Atomic Energy of Canada Limited or some, of the other, some other part of the nuclear industry. And now they're in the regulatory uh, business. And, and you, when you talk to these people, you, you keep wondering where their, where their loyalties really lie, you know, or whether they've made the transition very well. And I get the feeling that they haven't made it at all, some of them, that really the regulatory agencies sort of perpetuate the industry rather than control it. And I guess I could sum the whole thing up by saying that I believe that, that the regulatory agencies and the industries and, uh, and the politicians are just playing pretty dangerous games with people's lives. The story of Canada's uranium industry began in the 1930s on the shores of Great Bear Lake in the Northwest Territories. At the time, uranium had no commercial value. The big prize was radium, a radioactive byproduct of uranium. Then came the Second World War. The Allies raced the Nazis to build the world's first atomic bomb. Suddenly, they needed uranium. Lots of it, and fast. Under a shroud of military secrecy, miners were flown north and put to work in the old radium mine. Uranium from Canada and the Congo was refined in southern Ontario, shipped to the United States, and used to produce the bombs that destroyed Hiroshima and Nagasaki. George Blondin is a leader of the Dene Indian nation. He and other Dene people did odd jobs at the Port Radium mine and sold meat and moccasins to the miners. 
In the beginning, we didn't know what kind of ore was being taken out of here. We thought maybe it was gold or silver. But then we learned that this ore was dangerous. As soon as you take it out of the ground, it shoots out rays that can damage people and animals. When this mine operated, they didn't care what they did with the wastes. They just threw them into the lake. We had set up our camp on the other side of the bay, over there. We took our drinking water from there and ate the fish from the bay while they were throwing their wastes into the water on this side. We native people see the earth as our mother, and we don't like it when this kind of damage is done. Our ancestors told us a story that happened a long time before the white man came. One summer, some hunters were coming back from a caribou hunt up on the barren lands. They canoed down the shore of Great Bear Lake until they came to that point, over there, where that steep cliff rises out of the water. Our people always believed that it was bad medicine to cross in front of the cliff, but these hunters didn't obey the ancient warning. Instead of making a portage, they camped there overnight. That night, they were all woken up by the frantic chanting of their medicine man. Nobody slept because he chanted all night. When the daylight came, the medicine man told the hunters about his vision. I saw many people with pale skin, he said. They dug and worked and made a lot of noise. I saw what they were making with the rocks they were carrying out of the ground. It looked something like a log. Then I saw them put the log onto a great bird. The bird flew to the far end of the earth and dropped the log on the people who lived there. When the log fell, everything caught fire and all the people died. They looked just like Indians, those people. Like George Blondin, Jimmy Lacord worked at one of Canada's first uranium mines. It was a job that both he and his wife Elizabeth have come to regret. We didn't know anything about the rock they were taking out of the ground or what it was for. But now that we found out, we really don't like it. All work should be to make things better for people. If it's for war, that isn't the case. It's not right for us to work on something that we don't know what it is. Some people are saying that if an animal goes near the mining area, it would be dangerous to eat that animal. We used to fish and catch muskrat there. But since the mining started, we have been afraid of it, so we don't go near there anymore. With this ore, people in the south make bombs and prepare for war. We don't know much about that kind of war. We just live off the land. But they seem to think it's important to keep on making those bombs. Us native people were poor. We have our religion, but that's all. Although we pray, the talk about war goes on. 
Everything in the world is in the power of the Creator. We hope there won't be too much damage done, and we pray for peace. Uranium City, Saskatchewan. Monument to a boom and bust industry. At the height of the Cold War, the mines here supplied the essential ingredient for the American and British nuclear arsenals. When the military contracts ran out around 1960, little hope remained for one industry towns like Uranium City. But the federal government came to the rescue. Ottawa stockpiled uranium and aggressively marketed the Canadian-made Kandu reactor. Canada also initiated an international uranium price-fixing cartel. With the dawn of civilian nuclear power in the late 1960s, the demand for uranium increased. But for Uranium City, it was not enough. The mining companies had found richer ore bodies. Northern Saskatchewan has been called the Saudi Arabia of uranium mining. Here, along the rim of a great sandstone basin, lie the world's richest and most accessible ore deposits. By 1989, three open pit mines were in operation. At Collins Bay, on Wollaston Lake, the best uranium lay under the floor of the lake. So the mining company built a retaining wall, pumped out the water, and dug the pit. Across the lake from Collins Bay Mine is a community of 800 Chippewayan and Métis people. For years, Saskatchewan politicians promised that uranium mining would bring prosperity to the north. It never arrived at Wollaston Post. While the village elders play at traditional games, they are well aware of the much more ominous gamble on the other side of the lake. At stake in that gamble is the land, the water, the well-being of their people. <laughs> We have three important sources of food here, fish, caribou, and moose. If they are destroyed, what are the mining companies going to supply us with instead? When they eventually destroy the lake, are they going to bring us another lake we can live on? Though uranium mining has not brought prosperity, it has begun to deliver industrial pollution. Between 1981 and 1989, there were more than 90 radioactive spills in northern Saskatchewan. Several occurred at Wollaston Lake. Yet, government regulatory agencies have approved development work on three new mine sites in the near vicinity of the lake. Key Lake in northern Saskatchewan is the richest operating uranium mine in the world.
the richer the ore, the more radioactive the wastes. This equation presents a serious challenge. A vice president of the Key Lake Mining Corporation, Joe Anderson. As I mentioned, 30 years ago, there was not the same, uh, the same consciousness about environment as there is today. Uh, and, uh, of course, we also didn't have the same regulations as we did today. Now we have the regulations, and uh, Key Lake as a company uh, and as a good corporate citizen adheres to the regulations and tries to beat them quite a bit. The Key Lake mine opened in 1983. Within months, it was high profile on CBC's television news. Okay, A.B., try it again. When the Key Lake mine began production in October, it was called state-of-the-art, high-tech controls, the best equipment available. The mining company promised to shield the 450 workers from radiation and to protect the freshwater lakes that surround the mine. To get at the ore, the company had to drain a lake. That lake became the open pit mine. Water still seeps into the pit, where it's contaminated by uranium. It's pumped into a plastic-lined reservoir and later is used in the milling process. The mill had been shut down over Christmas, but water was still building up in the reservoir. There was no monitor to warn of high water levels, and it was too dark and icy to see. One of the mill operators said the first they'd heard about it, that they were having, they were working night shift, and they were having, having uh, supper uh, about 12.30 at night, and the foreman come in and looked very worried, and he says, we've got trouble, we've got a spill. These are the first pictures of the spill. They were taken at dawn on January 5th by a miner. The water broke through the reservoir and was still rushing out. 100 million liters of radioactive water washed out a road and drained into a small lake. The water is polluted with radium, which is known to cause bone cancer. Workers built dikes to keep the spill from spreading. While the January 5th spill is getting most of the attention, it was soon learned there had been eight other radioactive spills at the mine. Smaller spills by comparison, but spills just the same. The president of Key Lake Mining accepts responsibility, but he says there's no reason for concern. As an environmental uh, hazard or as an environmental uh, any impact it has, it, it's a, a non-event. Critics say it may be too late to stop the radioactive water from getting into the northern river systems. But the biggest concern is how those spills could have happened at all at what's been called the world's safest uranium mine. For The Journal, I'm David Kyle in Saskatoon. Effective uranium waste disposal would mean safe containment of radioactive substances for at least 200,000 years. Such a system does not yet exist, despite industry claims to state-of-the-art technologies. At Clough Lake, concentrated radioactive wastes were stored for a time in concrete containers intended to last a century. Within six years, hundreds were leaking. Even if there weren't these dramatic failures that put paid to the idea that things are so much better now, you would still have the long-term consequences to deal with. For example, the regulatory bodies have determined that in Saskatchewan they will allow the burial of rather uh, highly radioactive um, tailings, that is, as tailings go, relatively high radioactivity, in a manner which will not last beyond 50 years at the very outside. So that essentially when we're talking state-of-the-art, we're talking state-of-the-art to protect us, but not state-of-the-art to protect future generations. It takes enormous outlays of public money to expand the uranium industry. This investment has created few jobs compared to forestry, fishing, or manufacturing. And with international uranium prices at an all-time low in the late 1980s, only a fraction of the promised tax revenues have materialized. Yet the industry continues to grow. Uh, with an open pit mine, which is a comparatively cheap method of mining, and with the high ore grade, uh, it's a reasonable assumption that it's a profitable, profitable operation, but we don't reveal our costs or our financial information. All these big companies, all they seem to think about this money, money, money. I guess that's their God. But other people have 
a god too that looks after all the earth. Janet Feets is Cree. Since childhood, she's made a living on her trap line in northern Saskatchewan. If you have the money, you can do things. But uh, if you haven't got the money, you can't do very much about anything. As they say, money talks. And these people, these big shots, have the money to hire people to, uh, to uh, survey for them and all this stuff. While us little people, all we can do is scream about it, but the, the longer you scream, <coughs> the less they listen to you. There's posts and, you know, their claim tickets they have on there. They're made out of tins. They're all over the place. Sitting at my window there in my cabin, looking across toward the river, you can see one of the claim lines, right? A straight line. You know, they're all over the place. Well, nobody could stay here if they start... Uh, uh, Drilling here and blasting, you have to move away. I guess they don't see us as people. Maybe they see us as another stick of wood is standing there or something. They don't seem to care. What would they feel if someone went over to their, to where they live and destroyed their, their uh, livelihood, like trapping and fishing and stuff? How would they like it if someone went over there to destroy their, you know, the way they, they, they make their living? And we don't like this. We don't want them to strong our our land with that mining, that stuff that pollutes the earth and everything else around it. But one thing I sure know is that they make bombs out of these to kill people. Does it concern me? Yes, it concerns me as it concerns any thinking person when there is the capability in the world, as there is today, to wipe us out, and that capability has been here for a long time. But I view uranium as being primarily something for peaceful uses and, in effect, for power generation. And our uranium goes for power generation. I personally believe that from an environmental, total environmental impact, that nuclear power is the safest and best power available. Canada is the world's leading producer and exporter of uranium. Since 1965, federal government policy has required that our uranium be sold only for peaceful purposes. Numerous treaties and agreements confirm this policy. But once the uranium has left the country, Canada has no direct means of controlling its use. There is no way that uh, I can uh, be satisfied that there is an international system that would ensure that uranium, which is mined in Canada, does not end up at the end of a nuclear missile. In a transformed way, yes, but nonetheless, basically, uh, in the end of a missile uh, aimed at some innocent person somewhere on the other side of the globe. As citizens, I think we have to ensure that our government is capable of meeting the international obligations that it obviously has. Uh, the uh, obvious uh, answer at the moment is to say that we shouldn't be mining it. Uh, if we can't meet those obligations. And we can't.
When Dr. Robert Woolard and his family came to Clearwater, British Columbia, they knew exactly what they were looking for. We felt that it was a good place to raise children because I wanted my children to have a sense of a community, a sense of uh, how people interrelated and to grow up understanding that. And of course, you know, when you decide what kind of a small town Clearwater rec represents, uh, for, represented for us an ideal situation where you could enjoy practicing medicine and it was a very clean environment, a very beautiful place. Not long after the Woolard settled in, the community was approached by a mining company. The proposal was to uh, build an open pit uranium mine up on the mountain over there uh, and to uh, grind the rock up essentially there, slurry it down to the base of the, of the mountain just across from the school. And most of the waste products, which as you're aware are the main concern in relation to uh, uranium mining, were going to be left in, in a tailings uh, dump uh, just across from the school basically on the bank of, banks of the river. Initially, it's humorous. Initially, you say, well, how could anybody be so foolish? Uh, but then when you get to, to the point where you realize that people are, are seriously proposing this, that the government is very likely to let them do it, then there's no other response but outrage. It's, it's, no, longer, it's no longer humorous. It's, it's outrageous. And they lost any sense of... Uh, of moral credibility, I think, when they suggested that there should, in fact, uh, be a delight at the fact that it may wash away down the river. And by washing down the river, it be somebody else's problem. And I think there was a tremendous sense of moral outrage that, uh, that swept things at that, at that point. Well, you can't, you can't stop me feeling this anxiety that I feel if the mine comes through. I, I, none of you today have done that. I, if it goes through, I, I just couldn't stay here. I just... Well, this may be true. Uh, your anxieties are definitely different from mine. And unless you can assure everybody here that you will never have a drop of water escape from that tailing spawn, you will never get permission to go ahead. It was nice to feel that uh, you don't have to be bamboozled by experts, you don't have to allow outside forces to direct your fate, you don't have to accept something which is morally outrageous simply because somebody can say you don't understand it. Sparked by the Clearwater victory, opposition spread quickly across British Columbia. In response, the provincial government imposed a seven-year ban on uranium mining and exploration. Since the ban expired in 1986, a series of local referenda have been held in areas where uranium has been found. In spite of potential economic benefits, 85% of the voters said no. They don't want uranium exploration or mining. Not now, not in the foreseeable future. Canada's native people have not enjoyed the same success. They're stuck with the mines, stuck with the tailings. These will continue to poison the biosphere for hundreds of thousands of years. In human terms, forever. Um, you know, people talk about nuclear weapons or the nuclear industry, and, and so long as that is something what um, non-Indians, you know, in mm -hmm. urban areas can think about or can, can rally against, then that's something that they look at. But the problem is, is that, that's, that uranium mining is at the source of mm -hmm. all that. You know, if they didn't take uranium out of the ground, they wouldn't have nuclear weapons and they wouldn't have nuclear power plants, you know. And the other thing is, is that they don't even know that the most serious damage What's caused is what's caused to Native people, you know, because we're at the front end. 
right where it starts, whether it's us down in the what's called the United States or you people up here or over in Australia or in Namibia, which is in Southwest Africa, you know, all those places, our communities, we live there on the land and the only way what we ever knew to live, you know, and, and, and then they come in here and they start that mining and that mining, not only does it, does it bring something out of the ground which causes the destruction of everything, but it destroys our way of life. Mm-hmm. It destroys our communities, you know. And it destroys them not just for this generation, but for, for all the generations to come. To a lot of people, they think that what happens to Indian people doesn't matter to them. You know, but the fact is, is that when our water is destroyed, when our water is radioactive, when our villages become, you know, when our people start dying from cancer, that's exactly the same thing what's going to happen mm-hmm. to them white people. But they just don't even look at Indian people. They just pretend we don't exist. Our destruction is the same destruction what's going to be with the rest of the people, you know.